Good afternoon, everyone, and my name is Grace Suva, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. And so I'd like to wish you a good afternoon, and thank you very much to all of you for attending our webinar today. So I'd like to introduce uh, to you Andrea. She is uh, the RNEO uh, project lead for the BBG Champions Network. So if you have any technical questions that you'd like to ask um, with regard to the webinar, please send her a message in the chat box. Otherwise, myself, my name is Grace Subra, and I'm one of the managers on the implementation science team here at RNEO. And before I get started, just wanted to uh, cover some housekeeping items. First, we really want this webinar to be about you, and so we want it to be interactive, engaging. So the presenters may ask you some questions during the presentation, and otherwise we'll have a Q&A session at the end of their presentation. So we encourage you, and I'm hoping that you're able to see your chat box, type in the question that you'd like to ask, either during the presentation or during the Q&A, and I'll be more than welcome to moderate that and have your questions answered by your presenters. And just to let you know that these presentations are also going to be recorded, and so they can be archived and they'll be posted on the RNL website for future viewing. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our two presenters for today. Uh, we first have uh, Shelley McAllister, and she is the Director of Collaborative Practice and Chief Nursing Executive for St. Joseph's Care Group. Her areas of responsibility include professional practice, clinical education, client safety, and infection control. She has been actively involved in supporting implementation of BPG since the beginning of cohort five in 2015, and is excited to share some of the work that has been done since that they have become a BPSO. We also have Danielle Normand, and she is the nursing professional practice and BPS solely for St. Joseph's Care Group. Um, she is in her new role as of December 2019, so we welcome her. And she has been a successful advanced clinical practice fellowship applicant in 2016 and focused her fellowship in BPG implementation. She is looking forward to using her experience at the Summer Institute or BPG Clinical Institute and her fellowship knowledge to good use to support her peers in her new role. So for those of you who are not familiar when I say BPSO, that stands for a Best Practice Spotlight Organization. And BPSO BPSOs are healthcare as well as academic organizations who were selected uh, by RNAO uh, to, through a request for proposals process to implement as well as evaluate the implementation of RNAO's BPGs or best practice guidelines. So it is a positive partnership with a focus on creating a positive impact on patient care through evidence-based practice. And uh, typically BPSOs, uh, they enter in a formal agreement to implement multiple BPGs over a three-year period before they graduate or designated. So given that, I'd like to introduce you to your two speakers and Danielle, I'm going to pass the mouse to you. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction and welcome everyone to the Engaging Clients Who Use Substances webinar, Best Practice Guideline Implementation. And here we go. <laughs> Our organization is St. Joe's Care Group Thunder Bay. St. Joe's Care Group combines tradition and innovation in our mission to respond to the unmet needs of the people of Northwestern Ontario, offering a broad range of programs and services in addictions, mental health, rehabilitative care, and seniors health. We use an evolving model of client-centered care and continue to involve our clients more closely in their own care decisions to achieve health outcomes that are important to them. St. Joe's Care Group has a strong commitment to maintain our excellent level of care, evident through our commitment to integrate RNAO's best practice guidelines within our organization. St. Joe's Care Group gained our best practice spotlight organization designation in 2018. While we continue to work on guidelines from our designation period, a current focus and one of our guidelines being implemented within the 2018 to 2020 period is the engaging clients who use substances BPG. Today's presentation will look at the processes followed by our organization to implement this BPG, as well will outline the pilot project we've developed to identify, screen, and assess clients who use substances. More specifically, we'll examine our guideline selection, the use of the BPG uh, gap analysis to identify and confirm current gaps in practice, use of BPG recommendations to support processes that address client and staff needs, 
stakeholder engagement, developing and managing a plan for best practice champions, use of a BPG to guide the development of a clinical pathway, and our evaluation and sustainability up to this point. There were several points of engagement that influenced the selection of this guideline within our organization, including point of care staff, our BPSO steering committee, RNAO's advanced clinical practice fellowships, and St. Joe's care group nursing strategy, and we'll briefly touch on how these engagement points influenced our selection process. While St. Joe's care group specializes um, in mental health addictions programs and services, other areas of our care group, such as our complex care rehabilitation hospital site, might, may provide care and medical services to clients who engage in substance use without access to that specialized programming. And staff who work in areas without specialized addictions care have requested support in working with this client population. Our Nursing Quality Practice Council represents point of care nursing staff across our organization, as well as acts as our BPSO steering committee. And this council has participated in BPG selection and did request that the engaging clients who use substances BPG be considered due to an identified gap in knowledge and skill for caring for this client population. Specifically in regards to our complex care rehabilitation hospital site, the point of care staff felt um, that there's a perceived increase in the number of patients who use substances that are admitted to our rehabilitative care programs a lack of a care pathway to support these clients who use substances while they're admitted for rehabilitation services, and there's been staff frustration as well as patient dissatisfaction at times. We've had two RNAO Advanced Clinical Practice Fellowships that were done by my colleague Stacey Fremantle. Her work has provided actually the basis for the pilot project that we'll be discussing upcoming. As an RN at the Complex Care Rehabilitation Hospital site, Stacey echoed the concerns of our staff and recognized that there's a missed opportunity to address substance use and ensure that our client care aligns with our corporate goals for comprehensive client-centered care. And reflected in some literature that was found by Stacey notes that hospitalization provides a unique opportunity to identify and motivate patients to address their substance use problems in that patients are accessible, have time for interventions, and are often admitted for complications related to substance use that does render hospitalization a teachable moment. The use of this BPG also aligns with our St. Joe's Care Group nursing strategy. In terms of leadership, our engagement and training of champions is supporting leadership at the bedside. Looking at healthy work environments, the implementation of this BPG, we aim to foster positive client relationships, in terms of quality and best practice, the implementation of this BPG will provide evidence-based practice to support our practice changes. And regarding role clarity and scope of practice, the development of a new clinical pathway can provide clarity and role expectations for our interprofessional team. A gap analysis was completed examining the BPG recommendations from the viewpoint of our complex care and rehabilitative program here at our hospital site. Uh, for each recommendation, we reviewed our current state in comparison to the recommendations in the guideline to determine gaps in practice. Through this gap analysis, recommendations 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 identified some of our greatest needs and confirmed practice gaps. You'll also notice that the recommendations uh, we're focusing on look at screening and assessment, which also provided us with a place to start. Our key stakeholders um, when we started this project were identified as our professional advisory council, nursing, social work uh, practice councils, our expert addictions resource or addictions counselor, and our mental health and addictions building capacity working group. These are internal, internal working groups that include management and leadership from our addictions, mental health, and rehabilitative sectors, nursing professional practice and social work practice leads, point of care nursing and social work staff, a client and family partner, and our expert addictions resource, who is an addictions counselor from one of our specialized mental health sites. These groups were consulted and engaged throughout our planning phases for their expertise and knowledge um, related to input for the implementation of the recommendations that we had selected. To engage and develop champions, keeping in mind that the work we had upcoming with engaging clients who use substances, BPG, uh, St. Joe's Care Group hosted two RNAO addressing substance use champion workshops. Level one was hosted in 2018 with 24 participants from our organization, and level two was hosted in 2019 with 21 participants from our organization. We also had other participants from the region as well. And these workshops have aided to increase um, capacity and staff knowledge in substance use, as well as continue to grow our champion base. And some of the champions have participated on the ongoing working groups during the engagement phases of this project. 
As determined with our stakeholders from the recommendations that we selected through the gap analysis, it was determined that our organization would trial the selected recommendations within a pilot project, as I've, as I've referenced. Uh, we're implementing this pilot project at our complex care rehabilitation hospital site on one floor for the duration of six months. And as you'll see there on your screen, uh, it'll be using those uh, three recommendations leading to um, a, a better care plan and addictions resources for our clients. To develop the pilot, we looked at our selected recommendations and adapted the algorithm that's provided in the BPG to create a pathway for our organization. So we've mainly focused on um, pathway one. As you see there, I had uh, mentioned recommendation 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and 1.3 as our focus. So that's a focus on pathway one and just moving into pathway three there. And that's what we've adopted for our organization's use. Uh, here's the current uh, projected timeline for our project. In the pre-implementation phase, you'll notice all of the uh, many activities that I've already listed throughout our presentation here, as well as securing those resources required for this presentation. Moving into February 2020, we'll be providing point of care staff on the pilot floor with education related to substance use and screening tools that we've selected for our use. And one of those screening tools will be moved into our documentation system, Meditech, and our pilot will be commencing. Looking at March through, 20, through July of 2020, we'll be collecting our data on a monthly basis and monitoring our indicator data. Looking to July and August of 2020, we'll be making our evaluations, modifications if required, and developing that dissemination plan. And post-implementation, we'll be continuing to work on our sustainability planning. As with any project um, you are implementing within your organization, you'll always have uh, factors that are working against you and factors that are working for you. Uh, so in terms of barriers that we've come up with this project, um, attitudes and beliefs. At time, there is a stigma that is attached to mental health and addictions, but a large stigma. And sometimes there's frustration towards this client population, leading to overall low morale at times. Uh, knowledge and skill level, we have had that expression from our point of care staff that they want to increase their knowledge, skill, and capacity to improve their care for these clients. As well as staff turnover, during um, the planning phases for this project, we have had some changes in management, as well as ongoing staff turnover. And then identification and securing of an expert resource. So for us, that was um, looking for an addictions resource that we could help connect clients to. And currently, we have access to someone who is on our site temporarily but um, securing that was uh, something that needed to be overcome. And then the facilitators for this project um, definitely are champions. We recognize that uh, best practice champions are definitely an agent of change. And that's why that we um, opted to host those two addressing substance use workshops and growing our champion base in that way and, and um, accessing them during the planning phases. Um, our organizational resources, we do luckily have um, access to clinical educators who have built and delivered ed um, education that will be developed, uh, or sorry, rather will be delivered um, for our pilot rollout. And we do also have archived addictions, mental health web series that uh, staff can access at their own time, as well as responsive behavior training that we've offered. Um, in terms of our organizational supports, we do have those working groups, as I mentioned previously, the Addictions and Mental Health Building Capacity, as well as our Nursing Quality Practice Council, who've been very supportive of this BPG. They've assisted in that recommendation selection and they proposed strategies for implementation. And the whole goal of that um, Addictions Mental Health Working Group is building towards building capacity um, in mental health and addiction. So they've been very instrumental in, in this project. As well, we have that point of care staff who have expressed that desire for change and wanting to better support their clients, as well as leadership support. Despite turnover that we've had, there's definitely support from our leadership team in implementing this BPG, which is always important for moving forward with a project. So breaking down our recommendations a little bit further into our specific Im implementation within the pilot, uh, best practice guideline recommendation 1.1 is to screen all clients and to determine whether they use substances. Currently in our admission database, uh, nurses ask clients about a past history of alcohol use and then um, a, a statement related to substance and drug use. So we're considering changing this language a little more to be a bit clearer about asking about past history of drug, alcohol, and substance use and any current use. Uh, to determine clients who do self-identify as a person who um, uses substances. 
For the clients who do identify as a person who uses substances, we move into recommendation 1.2 of using an appropriate tool to determine level of support required. The Cage Aid is a valid screening tool that has been recommended by the RNAO and the Center for Addictions and Mental Health uh, for use in the hospital setting. In our pilot project, the Cage Aid screen will be offered to every client who states that they do use um, alcohol, drugs, or substances, and that screen will be performed by our point of care nursing staff. The Cage Aid consists of four questions that are listed here on your slide. It's fast, easy to use, and does not require any specialized training. However, to meet the needs of our nurses, our clinical educators will be providing training on the tool as well as topics related to substance use. It is important to note that we did request and receive permission to use this tool within our setting from the author of the tool, Dr. Brown. And we have gone ahead and inputted the CAGE aid um, as a Meditech intervention into our test system and that'll be ready to move into live once our pilot begins. If a client does answer yes to one or more of these questions, we'll be considering this a positive screen and it invites further exploration regarding substance use. To further explore that substance use, when a nurse has a client with a positive cage aid, they will notify the social worker who will offer to complete the Global Appraisal of Individual need, uh, Needs short screener, also known as the GAINS SS, with the client. And the GAINS SS allows for quick and accurate identification of clients with one or more behavioral disorders, for example, internalizing or externalizing psychiatric disorders or substance use disorders. The GAIN SS does require the completion um, of a 30 minute training module, um, which we'll be providing to our social workers here before the beginning of our pilot. And recommendation 1.3 is, is to conduct a comprehensive assessment with clients who screen positive for substance use. For our, our pilot project, we've determined that a comprehensive assessment is needed if the GAIN short screener um, produces a positive result. Our social worker uh, will then refer the client with their permission to an expert addictions resource to complete the comprehensive assessment. This would be considered a direct referral that provides that client with an opportunity to connect with an addiction specialist if that's what they are ready to do. If the client does not wish or isn't ready to meet with an addiction specialist, but staff feel that they require assistance to develop a care plan for the client, an indirect referral would then be made by our social worker to that addictions resource who will connect with staff regarding care planning for the client. And here's a draft um, of the pathway that we've created for our organization. Um, so it really does just go through that admission process there. Um, we have made one little tweak that didn't make it into this edit. Um, they'll be asking those clients about that substance use, yes or no, and then it's guiding staff where to go with the screens, what to do if they have a positive or a negative screen, and who to connect with, the social workers, where the appropriate resources will take them at that point. And then in terms of evaluation for this um, pilot project, we've selected five um, indicators, one being the structural indicator of the percentage of staff who will be receiving education, and move, then moving on to four process indicators that are, will be looking at the percentage of clients who were screened using the CAGE aid and the GAIN short screener, and then the per percentage of clients who scored positive um, with a CAGE aid or the GAIN short screener. And then looking ahead to sustainability, um, planning. Uh, we plan to be building this into everyday practice. So we've been able to do that, planning to do that so far by having that intervention into our Meditech, our documentation system that the nurses are already currently using, and the development of that care pathway for staff to have as a resource. Um, we have ongoing engagement of champions. While we're while doing our evaluation, we'll continue to engage those champions to provide us with that feedback. And securing an expert resource. As I had mentioned, we have currently have that addictions and mental health resources here on a temporary basis. So that'll be part of the sustainability planning, um, planning for potentially permanency or where else we can connect um, clients and staff with. And then we had uh, just listed as well, ongoing monitor of indicators and future indicators that we'll be looking towards, which could be related to staff satisfaction, um, client satisfaction, as well as safety indicators. And that will be concluding the formal portion of this process and we'll be moving on to any questions that anyone has. Okay, excellent. Thank you so, uh, so much, Danielle, for that uh, systematic and thorough overview of the implementation of the substance use BPG. Um, we do have a good amount of time for Q&A, so if you have any questions for us, please just uh, type them in the chat box.
And uh, we do have a, a question from one individual. Will you, you be using the BPG order set within Meditech to support guideline implementation? Hi, it's, it's um, Shelly speaking. Um, Danielle had done the presentation, so I'm offering to help with some of the historical pieces of this as she's newer into this um, guideline implementation. Um, at this present time, we won't be implementing the order sets. Um, we have, um, we use Meditech, um, however, the resources to implement we've found challenging, although we do see the value in implementing order sets. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that at this time. No worries, no worries, and thank you very much. Um, Jamie is asking, why were clients not engaged as stakeholders? Actually, clients were engaged as stakeholders, and uh, that's a very good um, that's a very good question that we didn't touch on in this. Um, we actually are fortunate within our own organization to have access to um, supports for clients with addictions. We have um, uh, we have a site called Sister Margaret Smith Center as well as our Bell Moral Center, and. Um, we met with clients um, at one of our sites to talk about implementing um, the KJAD and how they foresee um, the experience um, for clients when nurses who do not work in addictions ask those questions. And so they had given us some feedback on the importance of having a therapeutic relationship with the client, um, providing the education to our staff um, to prepare them as best possible. Even though they're four, four short questions, um, they had a lot of feedback to provide. The other piece of that is that we did, and it was almost, um, it was integrated into this project, but not as well as, as we could have, is there was a research project that was that is underway um, where we did some patient-oriented research um, and looked at client, there was a client researcher um, as well, um, sorry, there was a client researcher and they did chart reviews of the clients that we have within our site and um, who are engaging in substances and receiving um, antibiotic therapies. We're still um, going through that, but some of the immediate um, feedback that we've received uh, are um, some of the challenges that the clients had voiced even through the documentation. And then we interviewed the um, staff as well, and they provided us with some information as to some of the things that they would like to learn to support our clients who are engaging in substances. So um, we, did en we did engage our, our clients. Um, there's always room for improvement and there's always room for more engagement, but we, we tried our best. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Shelley, for highlighting that. Much appreciated. Nancy is asking, how successful have you been so far in terms of numbers? In terms of numbers, as far as our indicators? It, um, Nancy, if you don't mind clarifying that, uh, that would be great. Because this is something that has, um, that's it's still in the pre-planning phase, correct? We are, we're just about ready to start the pilot. So we, we actually don't have, um, we don't have any data to share at this point. Mm -hmm. We were just in a meeting prior to this though, um, talking to the expert resource that has been here, but we're trying to formalize that process. She's been here for um, a couple of months, um, as Danielle had mentioned, um, as a resource to our staff, but we've tried to formalize that process and I can't remember the numbers, but she has had um, quite a good response from staff making a referral. Um, some of the challenges that she had mentioned to date were um, client engagement, clients wanting to participate any further. Okay, that's great. And Nancy, I mean, you bring up a good point, um, what Nancy says in terms of um, the importance of evaluating, and as you had said, uh, Shelley, the importance of um, having an evaluation plan in place uh, before you start in collecting that baseline data so that you know uh, what to target in terms of the recommendations that you've selected. 
Okay, there is another question here. Uh, will, you, will you be sharing a copy of the pathway with us? So um, the PowerPoint is going to be shared, uh, emailed to those individuals who have registered for this webinar, and in there will be a, a draft of the pathway. So in terms of it being a draft, um, I, I'm assuming that as it's being piloted, uh, where they're going to be, uh, there is feedback uh, adjustments we're going to be are going to be made. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, but there's another question here. Do your mental health programs already utilize a similar process? Example, CAGE and GAINS. They use the GAIN, um, the GAIN short screen and the, um, the GAIN long screen in our mental health areas. Um, but they, we don't use the CAGE aid. Okay. Thank you. And uh, another question. What did you find most effective when engaging your champions in this work? I historically I think this is something that they have asked for and this was something that um, when Stacy who participated in the um, advanced clinical fellowship um, with RNAO she brought it forward as a gap that she identified when she was working on the floor mm -hmm. and so the nurses are very um, I think they're eager and uh, to learn more to help to support the clients that they're um, that they're caring for. Um, so the champion engagement piece, um, I think so far to date has been successful. I, I don't know if I answered that question though. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. are, are there specific, um, um, specific roles that you can foresee champions being a part of, whether it's in the planning process or in the rollout implementation phase? They've been involved in the planning process already to provide feedback on what types of supports they would need. So part of the referral process will be for either a direct referral or for an indirect referral to the expert resource. And the indirect referral um, is for situations where a client does not want to participate, but the nurses need some expertise on how to develop that care plan. Mm -hmm. And so our, our champions to date have provided that feedback as to this is what they need. This is the support that nurses need. Um, and what, you know, how can they care for um, those clients as effectively as possible? Because in our um, inpatient mental health or our outpatient mental health services, it's different than rehabilitative care. And so how do we then transfer their learning over to the staff that are working there? And so they provided a, um, a good amount of feedback in that regard. The other thing I see for our champions is continuing to engage in the evaluation, but are they receiving the information that, um, that they need? And also becoming the expert in that pathway so that they can be a resource to others who um, might need to might have a client who they feel um, ha is engaging in substance use and requires support so they can be the go to people mm -hmm. to share what that pathway will be. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And it speaks to the, the importance of the, the pilot and being able to finesse it using, um, you know, feedback from patients, clients, state, uh, uh, staff um, before you do a, a larger rollout. So, okay, excellent. Um, are your physician groups in support of this process as well? Any buy-in challenges? That's a good question. And as part of the pilot, uh, we'll need to engage our physicians even further. There, we haven't heard um, any negative feedback, um, but we probably need to be, do some more engagement with our physicians. Okay. Yeah, and it's uh, you know stakeholder engagement continue is an evolving process. It's not a one-time type of activity, so uh, definite opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question here. Uh, were you, uh, where were you stating when clients were not ready to speak directly to the addictions counselor? Were you stating their care team was working with the addictions counselor to make a care plan without a direct contact between addictions counselor and client? Could you repeat that please? Sure. Um, where you were stating when clients were not ready to speak directly to the addictions counselor, were you stating that their care team was working with the addictions counselor to make a care plan 
without direct contact between the addictions counselor and the client? Yes and no. Um, what we are anticipating as part of the pilot is that where there are scenarios where the client um, does not want to participate, um, we would need to get consent to share information um, with, the, um, with the social worker or with the expert resource, um, or it would be scenario based. And so we would not be able to share those client identifiers and then we would be accessing that resource to help us um, with ideas for the care plan, but we won't be able to give as much specifics without consent. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Jay Andrews has here, what resources were used to prepare staff to feel comfortable asking questions about substance use? We have not yet done that, but <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, we have had a working group in place for um, probably three years or so um, called Building Capacity in Addictions and, and Mental Health. And there was a series of webinars that were developed internally as we do have um, expert resources. And so we have shared those um, videos with our staff, but as part of our rollout, we also have plans for engagement with staff. So we have um, um, a mental health um, clinical educator who will be meeting with staff and going over some um, principles. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, she's going to be uh, speaking about motivational interviewing, giving some um, general information about addictions, um, providing opportunity for questions. Um, so that will be part of the rollout to prepare the staff to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense, makes sense, thank you. And uh, another question from Corey Martin who uh, is asking, how do you anticipate the challenge of staff buy-in in affecting the implementation or do you? Um, I feel that staff will, I don't know about buy-in, I think they're looking forward to having a, a clinical pathway that they can access expert resources. Um, I mean, the more that they understand addictions, I believe that um, the better care that they will have and the more that they will empathize with the clients. Um, so that will be part of it. I feel that our staff want to care for clients in the best way possible. So I don't see real challenges. I guess where I can anticipate a possible challenge is where clients may not want to participate. And so we are still going to have to learn from every situation. And you know there'll be um, education on an ongoing basis depending on the situations that arise. And we just talked about that this morning, um, uh, you know, in anticipation of what the next steps will be. And it will be dependent on um, the various clients that we, um, that are part of this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the plan in itself, it's, it's not something that is set in stone. It's, um, you know, informed by, you know, the response to the intervention from the patient's perspective, from the healthcare professional perspective. Um, and yeah, I, I, and to your, um, your, uh, your point about um, getting uh, champions involved in evaluation and the importance of being able to gain that ongoing feedback, um, I think will help to inform uh, the evolution of your implementation plan. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Nancy, she has another question. Do you have expert staff at the hospital to give individual care to clients identified as requiring assistance with substance use? Kindly share your success stories. We have, yes and no. So right now we have a temporary resource who is here one day per week and um, she is a resource from one of our sites that um, we were fortunate to be able to have on a temporary basis. And um, throughout the pilot, um, we hope to gain data that will support the need for an ongoing permanent resource. What we have though as well, if that's not the case, is we have access um, within our own organization to um, refer to other sites. And so they, the other sites within our organization are very eager to 
um, to work with us to make this pathway happen one way or another. And um, it, it's work in progress. We have tried this in years past, and so we're trying to formalize it as best possible um, and find a way to clearly identify clients who are seeking support. Um, and then a next step we can see is, you know, how do then we support our clients who are in rehabilitative care um, with access to um, resources in addictions upon discharge? And so even if we're able to connect those dots, that will help as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. No, makes sense. Um, uh, kind of a related question. Are there other organizations in collaboration? At the moment, it's just us. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. You have to start somewhere. Yes. Okay, and uh, Nancy, she just said, um, even if, even, yes, she realizes you're in the planning phase, but congratulations for such a great intervention. So she's in full support of what you're doing. Thank um, you. <laughs> and uh, another question here, will the staff frustrations, as mentioned earlier, with this group be addressed in any way? And if so, how will this be addressed? So perhaps, I guess, some of the um, barriers that were identified in the presentation, perhaps. Okay, when I think about building the therapeutic relationship, the more information that you know, the more that our staff are engaged um, in education and learning and working with the expert resource to understand addictions and mental health, the more they will build empathy and hopefully that will um, you know, will make it less frustrating and they will see progress and that they are able to provide better care for our clients. So um, we, you know, they, we need to continue to offer them the opportunity to express their, con any concerns that they might have. We always continue to look at um, the safety aspect of care. And, um, and so that's part of the process as well. Um, I, I think we need to just offer them the opportunity to let us know how they're feeling. And so that um, continual um, engagement with the staff, we're looking at um, evaluation again. So how do we continually evaluate the project and get that staff feedback along the way? And mm -hmm. we need to provide them with as much information and transparency as possible. Okay, yeah. And in, um, I just uh, see uh, amongst the barriers is stigma and um, you know, changing that culture and um, you know, breaking down the barriers when it comes to stigma. Any um, particular strategies uh, that have been outlined for that? Um, I mean, a video is only as good as a video, but we have an excellent video um, that was provided by one of our internal resources and um, that deals specifically with stigma of addictions and, and mental health that we'll be sharing. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nancy, she has a lot of great questions. She has another question. Are all staff working or recruited to implement this process mental health educated nurses? No. Um, the staff currently that we have access to is a social worker. And um, the educator that's going to help the nurses with the cage aid is a resource that does have specific mental health expertise. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, there's a lot of questions here. Let's try our best to get through them, Shelley. Uh, Sharon is asking, is this directly developed for an inpatient population only? So far for the purpose of the pilot, yes. Do we wish to spread it further? Um, Potentially, um, but so far, yes, just for inpatient. Okay, for the pilot. For the pilot, yes. For, yes, okay. Uh, Nancy has another question. Will you be making arrangements to have identified and willing participants in this program a special space in the inpatient unit? And who funds this program? Any special education or preparation for participating nurses and social workers? So far, no, We. I don't think that we have a special area for clients who engage in addictions. It's, I mean, there's so many people um, that, you know, engage in substance use of, of some, not so many people, but there are um, clients that engage in substance use that come from all 
walks of life. And so I, I think because they're there for rehabilitative care that we wouldn't put them in one area if that's what you're asking. Um, and sorry, the second part of the question? Uh, who funds this program? So we have been supporting this internally. Um, we haven't accessed any additional resources at this time. Okay. And any special education or preparation for participating nurses and social workers? Yes. Um, so again, um, we have a series of education. I believe there's seven modules that staff have access to with respect to understanding addictions and mental health. And we have um, the social workers, um, they have access to that as well. The social workers will be trained on use of the GAIN short screen. Um, and the nurses will be trained specifically on how to engage our clients um, in the questions of the um, cage aid. Okay. Next. Um, the question here is focus on harm reduction. I'm not sure, actually. Um, I wouldn't want to say no. I think it would de be dependent on the situation and on the, the clinical expertise of the, um, of the client. But we, don't, we haven't engaged in a strategy specific to harm reduction at this point. Okay. And Stephanie says, um, well, I might have missed this part, but when will it be asked to the clients during intake? I previously worked inpatient at St. Joe's and can see that that being a, a challenge? So right now, we plan to ask the question on admission. And that has been part of the discussion in that it can be challenging because you don't have a relationship with the client at that point. And so as part of the pathway, we have a, um, an opportunity um, if the client isn't willing to participate in those questions to go back. And so, you know, a week later, if you're, if you see that the client might be exhibiting symptoms of, um, of addiction, then there's another opportunity that you can go back and access the, the cage aid and start the screening process again. Um, and, and that can happen at, and at any point during their stay. But right now, the way that we have it set up, it's upon admission and part of the admission assessment. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Jenny, I wanted to comment that it sounds like you have a good plan in place. So thank you, Jenny, for sending those kudos. Uh, there is another question here. Um, is your nursing staff using psychotherapy, part of their scope of care according to CNO, you know, to interview current patients with mental health and possible addiction concerns? No, they don't have training in psychotherapy. And David, uh, I think you, you've already spoken to this about um, have you incorporated harm reduction principles into staff education, especially with those clients uh, who do not consent to a care plan? Um, and if so, can you speak to those principles? Um, yeah, and, and I just wanted to comment further. Actually, I'm glad that question came up again. So I know that in our addictions and mental health areas um, where they do um, work with clients with addictions, they do use harm reduction principles. And so because those experts are coming to our organization, I, I'm not sure what that would look like, but they would, again, use their clinical expertise and, and it would be um, depending on the client. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, Carla is asking, have you incorporated, and this is alongside also the harm reduction, a trauma-informed care approach into this process? And if you can, can you share any resources? Off the top of my head, I, I can't share the resources, but um, it is a priority within our organization um, to address trauma-informed care. And we do have um, a, a separate strategy um, with respect to that. And so it does tie together, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so that will be part of, part of the strategy, but that's a, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. So these initiatives, they're, they're not silo, they definitely have... Um, they know, all connect, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely, they, they connect with each other, yes. Um, and Nancy, uh, once rehabilitated, what's the next step? Most identified clients could be homeless and affected socially. What's the plan thereafter, integrating them into the community? We just talked about that this morning as well. Um, so I don't have all of the answers to the questions, but... Um, 
in you know when the client is um, meeting with the um, the expert resource that'll be part of the discussion there what we want to do is connect the dots and um, even if we can't provide as much care as possible while they are in rehabilitative care what we'd like to do is to provide them with referrals to community resources um, to the resources that are out there um, upon discharge so that's another pathway that we have yet to create but we are in discussions of okay okay um excellent and just um uh another comment and i believe we have to close but um jennifer was saying i love what you're doing here and addressing stigma and normalizing the conversation creates a safer space for people who might not have previously asked for help so again, uh, thanks Jennifer for sending along those kudos. And um, okay, one more question and then uh, we'll wrap up. But Nancy says, how do we help? Um, any ideas? If you have, any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> if we have any ideas, I, you know what, if you have any ideas for us that you would like to share, um, if you could send us ideas, your expertise, if you've, um, got any resources, we would appreciate any feedback from those that are listening. Um, again, we are in the beginning stage of the pilot and we are learning along the way. So we would appreciate your feedback. Excellent. And um, someone else was saying thank you as this is very helpful. And uh, just to let everyone know, uh, when you do receive this uh, PowerPoint, uh, there is the full contact information of Shelley and Danielle, and they have said that you are um, uh, free to contact them. And as Shelley had said, this is a, a space in the community for uh, champions such as yourselves to be able to uh, network and be able to share ideas and support each other. So given that, um, individuals say here, thank you. It was great what you're doing and keep up the good work. And thank you very much, Danielle and Shelley, for, for uh, sharing your experiences and expertise with us today. It was really appreciated. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone.